Hello, everybody. I'm Christian Lehman, and this is going to be our first session on Greek tragedy, where we will be looking at Euripides and his Bacchae. We are very fortunate to be able to use the translation of Euripides' Bacchae by Emma Pauly. Uh, I'm going to subtitle this lecture, which I don't usually do, as Fragmenting the Dichotomies, because one of the central premises of my approach to this play and of many others approach is that it's about the ways in which society tries to structure really rigid dichotomies, that is clear differentiation between one thing and the other thing, and the way in which that kind of rigid approach actually creates the structure by which it can be undermined and either shattered, fragmented as I write here, or mingled and merged. As a quick reminder though, let's look briefly at the house of Thebes. So you're going to be familiar, I assume, with some of the names at the bottom of this list. But where we start is at the top with Cadmus and Harmonia, two rather mythological figures who are the progenitors of this race. The people that we're interested in right now though are Semele and Zeus. Semele is a princess who Zeus falls in love with and um, rapes, has sex with, and it creates Dionysus. And this is going to be um, the major thrust of this poem, of this play, is around the veracity of this claim on Semele's part. Because when we open Semele's sisters, Dionysus's aunts, Atanoe and Aino, are spreading um, slander around this. Um, and Agave is also doing that. So this is, um, so Actian gets mentioned a few times. He's the person that's devoured by his dogs. Um, then we have Dionysus who's going to be important for us and Pentheus. So you will see that Pentheus and Dionysus are um, cousins. The line that you are probably familiar with is the line of Labdicus, which is over here on the far right, because that's where you get um, Oedipus, and from Oedipus, Polynices, and the Teocles, which is where you have the play, the Seven Against Thebes, and uh, the play of the Antigone, which um, is another major Greek tragedy that is frequently studied. Let's think briefly about the setting of this play. So we are in Thebes, and uh, Thebes is a city. So I'm just going to draw a wall here to represent Thebes. And 10 miles away, there is a mountain called Mount Kithron. So we have Thebes and Kithron. And um, because this is our transliterations of the Greek, there's different spellings. So my automatic is to spell it with the C, um, but the translation, translation we are using spells it with the K. And this, uh, from the beginning, right, we should be imagining these two different structures, and that's going to be the first of our dichotomies. Because the city represents this kind of classical Greek um, dichotomy of nomos versus phusis. That is, culture, law, and custom versus the natural. And so culture versus nature, city versus wilderness. Um, Control versus looseness is going to be a major theme, right? Because even think about it, imagine like the way walls work. It's an attempt to place control onto nature. Uh, we also have the idea of male versus female and the East versus the West, which is a um, problematic differentiation, but it's one that is going to be important in this play and it's important for our contemporary culture as well. And finally, Greek versus barbarian. We won't be pursuing this one as much right now, but I, I want to lay it down so you are familiar that it is one of these fundamental rigid dichotomies. Barbarian, by the way, uh, it is not the way we think of barbarian. It simply means non-Greek speakers because to the Greeks, anybody that didn't speak Greek, their language sounded like bar, 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 bar. So they are called barbaroi. A few pieces of vocabulary that show up in this play that are going to be important Dionysus is frequently called Romeos, 
which means um, like the bellower, and Bacchus as well. The women that follow the rites of Dionysus are called both Maenads and Bacantes. And so those words mean followers of Dionysus. Um, and then when you are performing the rites of Bacchus, you are engaged in a Bacchanal or a Bacchanalia. And this is a word that has come into our contemporary idiom to mean a great party. And then finally, we have what's called a thyrsus, which is a staff that's topped with uh, ribbons, or fillets, and a large acorn structure at the top. These are going to be artificial divisions that I'm basing around choral odes for the structure of the play. So these are not um, hard lines to draw. Uh, I think it makes sense to base them around the choral odes. Uh, other people might end a division with an ode. I'm going to be beginning them. But the play opens with a prologue. And it's Dionysus as Dionysus, laying out the terms and talking to the audience. Then we have the first part in which a chorus, and we'll remember the chorus is made up of foreign Bacantes, so people that are not from the Theban region. And they celebrate Dionysus's birth and kind of tell us those myths. We then shift from that choral ode to Tiresias and Cadmus getting ready to leave the city, and then Pentheus encounters them. Part two has a chorus that is discussing Dionysus's power, and that leads into a confrontation of Pentheus and Dionysus, who is disguised as a worshiper. And so we, as the audience, recognize Dionysus, but the idea is that Pentheus does not. Pentheus thinks that Dionysus is just a worshiper. The third chorus uh, is about Dionysus's power again, as well as kind of their growing anger at Pentheus. In this very, very busy section, we get the collapse of the palace and a messenger's report from the mountain about what's going on. And then we have the beginning of the seduction of Pentheus. Dionysus's seduction of Pentheus. Part four, we have a chorus on the happiness of survivors, and very famously we have Pentheus's delusion. Everything I'm going to I'm going to say famous a lot because everything about this famous is sorry, everything about this play is extremely well known. And the last part is the chorus uh, kind of talking about and revenge and the joys of revenge, leading into the messengers, the last messenger's speech on agave's double infanticide and regicide. And the point at which we end will be on her father and Cadmus's kind of therapy of her. So let's look at the prologue briefly. Dionysus as Dionysus. Dionysus comes out. Here I am, Dionysus, son of Zeus, in the land of Thebes, at your service. Cadmus's daughter, Semele, gave birth to me here in a scorch of lightning. Down from divinity, I have taken this mortal form here, where the Durke and his Manus meet. Uh, there are rivers, for those of you who haven't kept up with your classical geography. I can see her grave, my lightning struck mother's grave. This is her room, was her room, right beside the palace, still smoking from Zeus's fires, a burning that never dies away. Hera's fault, Hera's a mortal rage against my mother. So here what we have are the, the foundation, the mythological foundations of this story. So Semele is um, in this relationship with Zeus and a stranger comes up and says, oh, Semele, I hear you have this new boyfriend. You know, he says he's a god. Well, if you want him to really prove that he's a god, ask him for a favor. And when he says yes, tell him to reveal himself. So uh, this is Hera in disguise, who's mad that her husband is cheating on her. And Semele then says, next time Zeus visits, oh, you know, like, um, do you really love me? Will you really prove yourself? And she's like, yes, I will. And so Semele says, show me in your pure divinity. And when a god shows themselves in their pure divinity to a mortal, it ends up rupturing them in fire, flame, and lightning. And so Semele is destroyed. Zeus then um, actually takes, Semele, takes the baby, uh, Dionysus, and sews him up in the thigh. We'll see that in a second. But that's what's going on here with this idea of being lightning struck, Hera's fault, and her grave. Dionysus then continues and gives us some background on where he's come from. I came here from Lydia, where the wall earth bears gold, passing through Phrygia, then the expanse of sunstruck Persia. 
walled Bactria and the dread land of the Medes. None of this is going to make any sense to you, is it? Do those, any of those exist now? Then through Arabia, still have that one, right? And all across fair Asia, the places that hug the salt sea's coast, full of Greeks, and now I'm home. I have come here first before all other Greek cities to strike up the dances and to set down my rights so that mortal kind can know me for what I am, a god. And so what we have here is the idea of an expanse of religion. It's almost some missionary work and establishment, and you're used to seeing me say this, of power. Now we've constantly over the last few weeks been talking about how in mythology, it's about negotiations for power and establishing spheres of influence. And here we have Dionysus doing that act, right? He's already finished spreading his rites, that is the religious way in which you worship him. And just to remind you, right, we had Demeter doing this, where she was like, here's how you um, have my mysteries. That's a clear place where we've already seen this practice enacted. Dionysus continues, they, my aunts, said no. They pronounced that Dionysus was no child of Zeus, that Semele had lain down with some mortal, foisting the blame on Zeus for the product of an unmarried bed, acting on Cadmus's say-so. Zeus killed her, so they say, they shrill for it, for lying, and so I've driven them mad, driven them from beneath their roofs. They're up in the mountains now my wildness in their hearts. They bear my colors now, the trappings of my faith. All of Cadmus's female citizens, as many as there are in the city, all have left their homes. And this is the introduction to the topsy-turvy world, right? In the Greek society, women's proper place is in the home. Well, women have now left the roofs and they've gone to the wilderness. And not just women, all women. We've evacuated the urban setting of half of its population that used to be under the strictest control. So this is the first act that we see of Dionysus in terms of loosening up these rigid structures, these rigid dichotomies. It's always dangerous in Greek tragedy when a woman leaves the home. So in the Antigone, it opens, and Antigone and his Mini are outside of the walls, hatching their plan. Well, Antigone is hatching a plan. His Mini is trying to survive. Um, the Medea also opens fame with, I have come out of the house. This idea that women leaving the house is a really crucial part of myth once we're shifted into humans in mythology. We then enter the, the first chorus, and I want to really emphasize, these are foreign Picantes, right? So the women that we just saw here, all of these ones that have left their home, those are Theban Picantes. They're not making up the chorus. What we have is this group of revelers who have been traveling with Dionysus in spreading his religion. So the chorus says, she brought him to us first, Semele, in the throes of birth agony, death agony from Zeus's thunderstroke. She cast him out of the womb just before, crack, the lightning stole Semele away. And so Zeus, son of Kronos, made a shelter of his own for the baby. No hesitation, slit his thigh open and sewed the wound shut with gold out of Hera's sight. And so here's more of this idea of the myth of origin, the myth of origin. And you should be well versed by now with Zeus being the son of Kronos, right? With that patronymic epithet. We then shift out of the chorus and two old men emerge, famous men from myth. Um, Tiresias is the more famous. You have encountered him, I'm sure, many times, right? The blind prophet. Cadmus is the, head, the kind of scion of this lineage. So Cadmus. Shall we plant our feet and toss our far too graying hair? You'll lead, of course, age, waltzing with age. My Tiresias, you've always been the wiser of us, Cadmus. Um, then says later on, I may be mortal, but I know better than to ignore a god. Tiresias responds, but to them, we don't know better about anything at all. All our traditions, customs of our nations, all the ways of this age, we can't argue our way out of it. 
not by any measure of our hearts or minds, but now. Would anyone call me a fool? Say I shame myself and my years by joining the dance and wearing the ivy? So I really want to emphasize, right? These are old men. They belong to myth already. And they're saying, we can accept this new way. But nobody else is doing it. Nobody else is accepting this. Only we are able to do it. Um, and this scene reminds me here of Patrick Stewart and Sir Ian McKellen uh, dancing in their production of Waiting for Gatto. Um, so this kind of chorus continues, um, and now Pentheus comes out. I was out on business when I heard, away from the city. I've been told there's a new evil in my city, that the women have forsaken their homes. It's a front. It's a fake. A false bucket right. An excuse for them to cavort in the mountain's shade, dancing to honor this new god, Dionysus, whoever that is, whoever he really is. I hear they've got casks of wine up there, full to the brim, just sitting there in the midst of their frolicking, and that they sneak off into secluded corners, servicing men, excusing it as a sacred thing, a maenad's ritual. If it is a ritual, it's to Aphrodite, not this Bacchus of theirs. So here's the thing to emphasize. Um, Pentheus is just getting back to his city and he's discovered that it's in turmoil. It's in a topsy-turvy way. And his immediate reaction is that it's an evil thing that's happened. And he charges Bacchus with being false and fake, right? This thing that Bacchus opened up with, Dionysus opened up with by saying, hey, like, I am a real god. And this play is going to be about proving that and establishing it. The thing to remember about Pentheus is Pentheus is young, all right? He's probably 18 years old. He doesn't know about sex, he doesn't know about relationships, and he has this enormous insecurity with masculinity. Right, what we would actually today call fragile, fragile masculinity. And he slut shames these women. He's like, oh, they're all out there servicing men, right? That means like giving sexual favors to men. That's his suspicion. And then he says like, they're saying it's a sacred thing, but like really they're just being promiscuous. And then he claims it's a right to Aphrodite, right? You know, goddess of sex pleasure. And, um, joy in bodies. Heresius responds, but as for this new god, this one you sneer at, I cannot describe how far he will spread over Greece, how great his rise, for there are two things, young man, so there's that idea of youngness, <clears throat> two that are prized above all else by men. The first is the goddess Demeter, for she is the earth. Call her whichever you prefer, it is she who brings forth solid food from the earth dry goods, if you will. But her junior, Semele's child, showed us the other side of the coin, found the nectar and a bunch of grapes, and gave it to mortals, letting them be free of pain when they partake of the river of the vine. He gives us sleep to forget the evils of the day for a time, and there is no better prescription for pain. So this is our celebration of wine our celebration of wine. And one of the things that I want to produce or um, suggest is that wine is a substance that breaks down these dichotomies, right? It lets you inhabit a space in between them where you're neither sober nor drunk. And when you're in that stage, you're in an in-between stage, what we might also term a liminal stage, a liminal stage. And, uh, that's a joy, right? That's a, that's a thing to pursue because it means you have surrendered complete control, but you haven't given into complete wildness. So you're in a stage of like human produced um, manic living. So again, uh, this is an old person talking to a young person. <clears throat> and this old person says like, I don't know how far he will spread, right? This is a religion that is rising. He offers, Cadmus then offers a really important insight into religion. Child, 
And there's again, that emphasis on youngness. And you might remember in say something like Oedipus, Oedipus is also always upset about age, how old people keep calling him young. And here we have a reverse of that. We see um, other people that are kind of calling him, um, Pentheus young child. Tiresias speaks with knowledge. Stake your claim with us, not set apart from the laws of nature. You're not thinking clearly. You're all over the place. And even if he's not divine, even if he's just as you say, just say he is. Make it your best lie you've ever told. Let Semele be remembered as the mother of a god and bring glory to our family and our line. This is a pretty famous philosophical concept that has um, a more popular term um, that we might use in terms of a, a, um, a philosopher later on, which is Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager essentially is, well, I can't prove that God exists, but if I say he doesn't, then I'm gonna go to hell. So if I say he does, then I can go to heaven. So even if I don't believe, I'm still going to say he does because either I go to heaven and, or I don't, but if he does exist and I say he doesn't exist, then I go to hell. So this is this idea of Pascal's wager and Cadmus is introducing this, the concept of this. Um, he's not, Pascal is much later. Okay, much, much later. So don't think that Cadmus is citing Pascal, but Pascal's wager is this term that we use to think about this um, religious and philosophical debate. And it even has an extra bonus, right? Hey, like by giving credit to Semele, you are giving credit to our family and our line. So really it's a like, complete win, 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 win. The next part, um, <clears throat> we learned that Pentheus has had Dionysus, the worshiper, captured. So the second time we see Dionysus, we see Dionysus as a celebrant, a bacchant of Dionysus, not as Dionysus himself. So a soldier says, we've snared the prey you sent us for. We, you, we've made it worth your while. He's a docile creature, didn't flinch, didn't flee, but gave himself freely into our hands, didn't even turn pale didn't lose the flush in his cheeks. He just laughed. Let us bind him and lead him off. Made it easy for us. So in these words, snare and bind, we see the ideas of control, right? So this is a play again about binding and loosening. Um, and so we have the dichotomy, which is so like, right, if you bind somebody or snare them, they've gone from free to captured. And we're thinking about ways that we can fragment those dichotomies. And so one of the things that Dionysus, the great loosener is going to do, will explore as we go forward. Again, wine is something else that loosens you. Pentheus, now looking at this worshiper, untie his hands. He's not lithe enough to wriggle out of this net. Well, not ugly, certain, certainly, but not to your women, I've heard. Is that why you've come to Thebes, stranger, for the women? Long hair. Not a brawler then, the way it falls over your face, a promise of desire, smooth skin, carefully maintained, never worked in the sun, yeah? Kept yourself indoors, behind bedroom doors, doing Aphrodite's dirty work with your looks. But tell me about you, tell me where you're from. So we have this breakdown now, and um, as you're reading this translation, you'll see that Cad um, Pentheus is gonna shift between gender pronouns as well when it comes to describing Dionysus, because there's this great ambiguity, ambiguity. We also see Pentheus is a kind of probably repressed sexuality. Where he says, not to your women, I've heard. So he, uh, Pentheus obviously finds this person attractive. Notice that they cat Pentheus catalogs Dionysus's looks, um, but he displaces that desire on other people while adding this suggestion at the end of, oh, I bet like you will just um, give sexual favors behind bedrooms. That's why you're pale skinned. Pentheus then starts um, asking questions about the rights of Dionysus. And are these rights conducted by day or by night? night for the most part. It's so much more 
Hmm. Spiritual. Good for devotion. This is very suggestive. The night's a trap for women's virtues. And the day isn't? You don't get out much, do you? Pentheus later on. Get out. Throw him in the stables, into a horse trough. Make sure there's no light for him to see by. You can dance there. And as for your accomplices, the ones you've brought to our city, we're going to sell them to the highest bidder. I'll bind their hands to the loom and keep them in service instead of beating at drums with that racket they keep up. So Pentheus's response to his repressed sexuality and to uh, his desire for Dionysus's body is to bind him, right? Throw him in the stables, get rid of the light. And then he says, you know what? For all the people that you brought here, we're going to sell them. That's this idea of slavery. And I'll bind their hands to the loom. So again, that language of binding that we see. And by saying to the loom, he's saying, I'm going to put these women in their proper place, right? A woman's place is in the house working at a loom. A loom is what you use to um, process cloth. As we move forward, the chorus starts growing angry at Pentheus, and we are going to get a collapse of the palace, but the chorus opens. Pentheus, monster, fearsome beast like none of mortal kind. He is a giant, a bloodstained creature in a death match with gods. Pentheus comes for us. Soon he will loop the noose around my neck. I, who am bound to Bromios and no other, he has our leader already tied up in the house, cast into confining darkness. Do you see this, Dionysus, son of Zeus? Do you see your chosen in danger of capture? Come, bearing a staff of gold down from Olympus. Come and conquer the pride of this bloody-minded man. So this bit here, giant in a battle, death match with gods, that should remind you of the Gigantomachy from our discussions in the Theogony. And then they pick up this language of the noose, looping the noose. Um, and notice, so they don't know, the Bacantes, the chorus doesn't know that this um, Dionysus is Dionysus. They think that he's just the leader of their band. So they're saying like, hey, come and prove yourself Dionysus because things are about to get really bad for us. Um, at that point, there's a huge earthquake and fire starts striking. So this must have been amazing to see however they managed to do it. Um, back in the ancient world. So you can, it's fun to, fun to think about that. But Dionysus comes out and the chorus is saying, but your hands were bound, how? Dionysus, ah, yeah, well, I may have made the whole thing a little hard for him. Humiliating, actually. He thought me he, he had me in his clutches, but no, not for an instant. He fed that hope in vain. Near the prison he'd tossed me and someone put a bull in his path. Pentheus threw the chains everywhere he could reach to tie the beast down, right down to the hooves. He was breathing hard by the end of it, sweat pouring off of him, gnashing his teeth, everything. I was right next to him, watching quietly. Then Dionysus reached down and shook the house to ruin. Then, just to be sure, he called fire to light up his mother's tomb like a beacon. And so here we have the introduction of the idea of delusion which we'll see again. Um, the bull is connected to another aspect of Dionysus. So in certain versions, um, when he's born, he has horns, these bull horns. So it's with that. And then we also get um, this displacement, right? Where he says, oh, then Dionysus did this thing. But really, it's, it's, it is the person speaking. Who is Dionysus doing this thing? And we have the destruction of the palace. So the destruction of the palace fits into this idea of the breakdown of the dichotomies, right? The fragmentation of dichotomies because the palace, which was a whole structure, is cracked open and fragmented. And it's fragmented by earthquake and fire, natural elements. Earthquake and fire are natural elements versus the palace, which is a human um, piece of artifice. So the messenger comes and says, claims to have seen what's going on in the wilderness. And it's a long speech, but here's just a short selection introducing um, some of the ways in which the proper role of women has been overturned. They, women, took children from their homes. Whatever they took with them on their shoulders, none of it fell to the ground or needed any ropes to tie it down. But not bronze, not iron. They wore fire in their hair, but they were not burned. 
Some of the townspeople took up arms in retaliation, marching out against the Bacchae. It was terrible, my lord, terrible to watch. The points of the men's spears could not draw blood. But the women did, hurling their staves like javelins. They did their damage and took flight. Women, women did this to our men, and not without a god at their backs. They went to their, back to their base after that, the spot where the god had sent forth the fountains for them. They washed the blood off there. I saw the snakes licking the last drops of their faces with pork tongues. Um, so here we're just getting a, a bunch of um, examples accumulating of just how unnatural these women are behaving, even though perhaps they are behaving more naturally. So uh, we then continue with a confrontation and this is getting to the, the seduction of Pentheus because Pentheus now is starting to get the idea that he wants to see these things. So the messenger gave this speech. It was very vivid, a very vivid speech. And it kind of conjured the images up before Pentheus's eyes, but now Pentheus wants to see it himself. Dionysus, do you uh, want to see them all together sitting up in the mountains? So much. I'd pay good money to see that. Oh, why this sudden passion? What could have come over you? Well, it would be upsetting to see them drunk, certainly, but you'd enjoy it, even if it's so unpalatable? Yes, of course, I, I could sit under the pines. I'll be quiet, but they would hunt you down, no matter what stealth you used. So this is introducing one of the, um, another major theme of the play, which is the idea of truth in the gaze. And so we have um, what I'll be using. We have the voyeuristic, aspect here, the voyeuristic, meaning the, the looking at other people without knowing that you're being seen. And so here's Dionysus's plan. In just a minute, you are not dressed for it. A nice dress, preferably linen, and then you'll be ready. Oh, what? Go from man to woman? Why? They'll kill you if you look like a man. You're, you're right, again. You've been right this whole time. Dionysus taught me well. How should I do what you ask? What's the best way? Come back inside. We'll get you changed. Into what? Women's clothes? I can't. It would shame me. So, you don't want to see the main ads that badly? What do you want me to wear? But let's deal with your hair first. It needs to be longer. I can take care of that. And next, any other costume pieces? And so you see here, um, Pentheus has increased desire to take part and to see, and even starts getting into the idea of cross-dressing. So here we have cross-dress, and with that, we have, um, we're breaking, we're fragmenting gender binaries. All right, so we're fragmenting gender binaries. We enter our last um, phase here, and the chorus opens with this kind of explosion of happiness. Happy is the one who escapes a sea storm and comes home to the harbor, and happy is the one who stands against their hardships. Happy are they who endure. One man may exceed another in his own way, in wealth and power. Countless hopes for yet more countless people. Sometimes hope wins out, gives us riches, and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes we fail. And the one who can live in spite of this, who is happy day to day, that one is blessed. You just, it's a tonal shift now for the chorus as we are moving into our final bit. It also, though, is um, ironic because Pentheus has not survived. Uh, well, he will not survive, sorry. So first he emerges, all right? So now you should imagine the actor had gone inside, and now has come out and is dressed all like a woman. And he's experiencing this delusion, this delusion, Dionysus. My goodness, a daughter of Cadmus, how lovely. Pentheus, I, I can see two suns, I think. Two sets of seven gates around the city, two Thebes, and you, you're the bull. You look like a bull right in front of me, leading me on. I can see horns on your head. Were you wild before? A beast, not a person? You're a bull now, I'm sure of it. Dionysus, it's to God's presence. He walks with us. So notice here, what we get is we have this doubling happen with the delusions. This is part of that voyeuristic doubling, um, seeing two, right? 
with a dichotomy, you think you have one thing and the other thing. And now by seeing double, it breaks that down. Like what is the reality when you are hallucinating? What is the reality when you are hallucinating? And he even introduces this own breakdown, right? He can't put his finger on whether Dionysus is a beast or a person. In the same way earlier, he couldn't put his finger down on what gender Dionysus was. This uh, conversation continues. Spitting image, uncanny. But here, this lock of hair has come loose. It's not where I put it under the headband. Might have done that inside. I was practicing main adding, tossing my hair and all that. Of course you were. Come here, I'll fix it. That's what I'm here for. Hold still, head straight. All right, set it in order, I'm all yours. And your belt is too loose. And these pleats, they're all uneven around your ankle. Seems all right on the right side, as far as I can tell. It's not too bad. It's a nice cut on me, ankle length. So again, you see Pentheus getting into this role of cross-dressing, being concerned, being active in his costuming. And you should also be thinking that this is a play, and so we have costumes inside of costumes that are happening, right? The action on stage is commenting on what the role of theater can do, how the role of theater can transgress, how the role of theater can transgress. We then move into the last section. The chorus introduces some things. Let justice show herself, let justice bear her sword, let her open the throat of this man, let her cut down the son of Echion the man who sprang from the earth, atheon, anomon, adikon, ungodly, unlawful, unjust. He comes with violence in his head and injustice in his heart. With this, he goes against your worship, Bacchus. With this, he desecrates your mother. With his wits incensed and his will in uproar, he's on his way. He comes to conquer the unconquerable. Death will teach him temperance. In matters divine, there is no excuse. So here we have the idea of divine justice. Pentheus needs to die because he um, didn't honor the god. And so the action happens off stage, and a messenger returns. His mother, and that's Agave, was the high priestess. It was her right to go first, to begin the killing. So she threw herself at him. He tore the headband from his head so that she would recognize him. But poor Agave, to stop her from killing him. He touched her face and said, it's me, mother. It's me, your son, it's Pentheus. You had me in Echion's house. Mercy, mother, mercy. Please, I know I messed up. Please, please don't kill me. Don't kill your son. She was foaming at the mouth and her eyes roved everywhere. She wasn't thinking clearly or at all. Bacchus had hold of her. She didn't listen, grabbing his left forearm in her hands, she braced her foot against his bruised ribs and tore the arm from his shoulder. So I wanna to point to a couple of things here. Notice how she's called a high priestess. And so what we have here is a perversion of sacrifice, a perversion of sacrifice. And one of the things that she does in this is tears his arm off and his whole body ends up getting ripped apart. And this is a technical term called sparagmos. Sparagmos. And what that is, is like the ritual dismemberment of a figure. And then Agave re comes on stage and she has a thyrsus and on the thyrsus is the head of Pentheus, her son, right? So she, by killing Pentheus, she's killed her son, infanticide, and the king. So it's regicide, so it's this kind of double, double action. Daddy, to Cadmus, we've brought you bragging rights, the right to say you have the finest daughters in the mortal world, all of us, well, mostly me. We left the loom behind and went on to bigger and better things, to the bare-handed hunt. I have the victory spoils right here, see? I brought them here for you to hang up in the house, here. You should hold them, Daddy. Be proud of our catch. Tell your friends, have a feast. We are blessed, blessed for what we have done. So here we're hitting some of these same things, right? Like women leaving the house, going to the wild, and what happens, it ends up being a kind of perversion of the sacrificial rights of what men do with the hunt. Because what she's actually done is killed her son, hunted her son. And now we have a really um, very gentle moment between Cadmus and his daughter, Agave. 
as he almost uses talk therapy to bring her out of her madness. First, I need you to look up, look at the sky. Okay, okay, why am I looking at it? Does it look the same or has it changed? Brighter than before, sharper. How do you feel? Still overwrought? I don't understand. I think I'm coming down from whatever I was before. Something's changing. Can you hear me? Can you answer me clearly? Yes. I, I forgot what we were saying, Daddy. Whose house did you go to when you were married? You gave me one of the earthborn. That's what people call them, Echion. And who is the son you bore there to that husband? Pentheus, he's mine and his father's. Whose head are you holding in your hands? Before we look at the last bit, I do want to stop here. Because what we're seeing is um, a return to sanity. And another way we might word that is sobriety. A return to sobriety. And remember Dionysus, the god of wine. Um, this idea of control and lack of control and how you have to um, mediate those things. Agave says, a lion's. They said so in the hunt. They said so. Cadmus, look again now. Look clearly. It's not hard to see. What is this? What am I holding? Look, you'll understand. I see sorrow, the greatest sorrow. Does it still look like a lion? No. No. It's Pentheus. It's Pentheus's head. No, please, no. And then the play resolves itself. So a few things, well, I don't really have too much more to say, but another word that I want you to be thinking about this whole time is transgression and the transgressive and how this play mediates those ideas through this fragmentation of dichotomies that ultimately realize, we realize in the destruction of the palace and the destruction of Pentheus's body. The destruction of the palace and the destruction of Pentheus's body. All right, I hope you enjoy working through this play.